So a very good morning to you. You're very welcome to this morning's Signpost webinar. Uh, my name is Mark Gibson and I'm head of the Chagas KT Outreach and Innovation Department. This series is brought to you by Chagas in collaboration with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, the National Rural Network and Food Drink Ireland Skillnet. And today we're joined by Pat Murphy, who's going to be helping us with questions later on. Good morning to you, Pat. Good morning. And just before we introduce our speaker, I just want to talk about the, the topic we're going to be discussing today. And the Agricultural Catchments Programme is an intensive monitoring programme of farming in, farming's impacts on water quality across Ireland and is coordinated by Chagask. An important part of this monitoring programme is soil fertility. So I'm delighted to be joined by Eddie Burgess, who is a catchment science specialist with the Agricultural Catchments and who's going to talk to us about soil fertility trends in the Agricultural Catchments Programme. Eddie, good morning to you. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Pat. Good morning to all, all the people viewing and listening in. So you're both coming to us from County Wexford this morning. Am I right in that? No. I no. Am not where Eddie. are you coming from, Eddie? I should have asked you earlier. <laughs> uh, earlier on. I, I'm quite confused where I'm coming from, Mark, to be honest. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm on the border of three counties between Carlow, Wicklow and Wexford, but I'm actually in County Wicklow just... Okay. OK, OK, so it's nearly nearly right. So, um, Eddie, maybe you could tell us a bit about the, the work uh, that you're doing. Those of uh, those who aren't familiar with the Agricultural Catchments Programme, could you tell us maybe a little bit more about that and, and how that fits in to the overall, the bigger picture in terms of water quality? Yes, Mark, um, the, the Agricultural Catchments Programme, we, we've presented here a few times before and we've given an overview of, of, of our whole programme, but we're established now in almost 14 years and we're funded by the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine to evaluate the measures that are um, imposed under the nitrates directive, the good agricultural practice measures and its derogation. All quite topical just at the moment because every four years the nitrates directive gets reviewed and the measures that are included in it are, are some of them are usually changed and in previous reviews of the nitrous directive, most of those changes have been favorable in that there have been a relaxation of restrictions on agriculture that um, allowed people doing things at, at a longer period in the year or increased application rates. But it is likely with the environmental um, focus and, and uh, trends in water quality and gaseous emissions, all the topics that are being discussed here in these webinars are putting pressure on at the moment and it's likely that, that uh, the current round of the review of the nitrous directive is not going to be as favorable as it has been in the past but we're we're very key and central in that and we, we report every year to the european commission on the impact of the derogation and um, it, it goes through the department of agriculture and the department of housing but the epa and the catchments program and make up the bulk of the science that goes into that review of the nitrate sterigation. Great. Okay. Okay, Eddie. Well, that's a, that gives us a good overview of, of uh, the, the catchments program. So if you could perhaps share your screen with us and uh, we will uh, get into the presentation. Um, we, we should uh, issue a health warning at this stage. Uh, there are quite a few graphs in your presentation. So uh, unfortunately, we didn't get the opportunity to send people 3D glasses for the your presentation, but um, I think you have a really strong story to tell uh, in those graphs. Um, so Eddie, we'll hand over to you uh, just before we do, just to remind everybody uh, that you can submit your questions to us to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And also today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Chagas website in the next <coughs> days along with the presentation and also the audio version will be available on the signpost uh, podcast so eddie we'll hand over to you thanks very much mark um, yeah um be, be, before i proceed with with the talk uh, first of all i'd like to acknowledge a, a lot of help that come in from one of my colleagues in the catchments program uh, simon leach um is a technologist working with our program and he works with a database for a lot of the results of the what we call the spatial data, the, the soil fertility and, and uh, other things that are happening out in different locations around the catchments are all recorded and Simon has done a lot of the number crunching on the details that, that I'm going to go through with you now. So just, just to say thanks to Simon on that. Um, 
what, what I am going to go through here really, first of all, as I mentioned, the catchments program is a water quality evaluation program and people may ask why are we so involved in soil analysis and soil samples, so I want to give a quick overview of that and how we do it in the catchments program and what we do. Um, Having done that, I want to look at the trends in soil fertility that we have found since we started in the catchment program. I know that Pat and David Wall and Mark Plunkett produce a publication every year on the trends nationally on all soil samples that come through Chagask, and it's a very useful and informative publication. Where our soil results and our campaign differs from that is that um, the soil samples that we take are from the exact same fields. We, we do a soil sampling campaign every four years, and we go out and resample the same location in the same field in the same manner. So we can look at the exact trend in a field, on a farm, or in a catchment. And in today's presentation, I'm going to go through the comparison between different catchments and different enterprises. And I do apologize in advance, there are a lot of graphs coming up in the presentation, but really when I want to try and show trends, um, that, 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 that's inevitable. Um, and finally, uh, I, I, I want to give a couple of implications and like you to consider um, what is happening with phosphate, the uses of organic manures and on the pH and soil type and the implications that that has on the soil trends. So the catchments program in general, as I mentioned, is evaluating water quality and water quality for the water framework directive. I think the biggest single factor that, that uh, needs to be approved for targets under the water framework directive is, is river ecology. At, at, the, at the end of the nutrient transfer continuum, as we call it in, in the catchments program, but nutrients have to come from somewhere. There is a source of nutrients they may not make it as far as the river or the estuary or the lake, and they may not have an impact when they do get there. But if they aren't there in the initial um, place, uh, they won't, they won't uh, be a problem. So the main reason why we are looking at uh, soil fertility and taking soil samples every four years is to get an assessment of the source of nutrients. And nutrients that cause a problem in water quality are nitrogen and phosphorus. They're the two main nutrients that cause a problem for eutrophication. Phosphorus largely in freshwater bodies and nitrogen is the limiting nutrient largely in saline or marine waters. Um, and, and the measures being implemented under the nitrates directive may be targeting different locations along this path. Um, and, and we're familiar, there are stocking rate limits, there are fertilizer limits based on soil samples um, and on your stocking rate and the crop type and the cropping history. And these are all source limiting measures in the nitrates directive. They may have an impact on stop, but in some cases, it doesn't take a lot of a nutrient for the problem. And that is the mobilization stage and mobilization, for example, if you plow a field of permanent pasture, you're going to release a lot of nitrogen that was previously tied up as organic matter. It gets mineralized and in a mineralized form as nitrate, it's available to be leached. So that, that's the mobilization part of it. Um, and there is measures for, for stopping the transfer of nutrients with buffer strips. And recently we've seen a lot about the delivery of nutrients into our estuaries in the East and Southeast with the total load of nitrogen that is getting there. And the impact. So that's just an overview of the approach we're taking, but the very start of it, we're looking at the source of nutri nutrients, and that's why we, we, we go out and do these soil analysis. And we have six catchments in the program, but for three of them, three southernmost catchments, they're the ones that got established first. And in those, we have now taken four, we have done four different uh, soil sampling campaigns. First of all, in the winter of 2019, uh, 2009 and 10, sorry, not 19, there's a misprint, beg your pardon. Then four years later, and four years later, and then last winter, a year ago at this stage. 
And as I mentioned, it's the same area sampled every year and it is stored in the database that Simon is working with. And it's the standard soil analysis tests that we do, soil pH, the buffering capacity, phosphorus and potash. And more recently, the catchments program has taken on a role for climate change and carbon sequestration. And those were sampling soils also for carbon content. Um, a key point is that the farmers in these six catchments um, didn't choose to partake in the agriculture catchments program and they weren't looking to evaluate the nitrates directive. So there was a lot of work um, by advisors working in the program to, to encourage them to work with us. You, you can imagine they would have been quite hesitant and maybe apprehensive when they heard that they were involved and located in an area for assessing um, the nitrates directive. But the single biggest, um, if I was to pick a, a single factor that encouraged farmers to work with us, it was the fact that we sampled their fields and went out and presented the results and discussed nutrient management planning with them. So not only are these soil samples used for the researchers in our program, they also are a key part of our advisory uh, role and are keenly sought after by the farmers. There's a, just over 300 farmers in the program and they're very um, pleased and keen to know what their soil fertility levels are. And I, I would, uh, under observation from the four campaigns, each time we go out and do a soil sampling campaign, the level of interest and demand for the results increases. So pH, Soil pH, I think, is like the foundation of all nutrient management. And uh, I'm just going to do, go through first overall in the three catchments in Timaleek and the two catchments in Wexford and Ballycanoe, just to look at the soil pH. Um, and I have broken it down into different bands there from soils above seven, between six and a half and seven, uh, 6.2 to six and a half. So they, they would be the three. Uh, bands that we would ideally like to see our, our, our pH in, and then suboptimal would be below 6.2. So from 6 to 6.2, 5.5, and, um, and, and, and below that. So th these are the bands of, of the pH. And you can see over time from the first campaign, the soil pH has improved between the first and the second. And then it took a significant jump into the third campaign and is not quite so good at the last campaign. Uh, in the last, last winter, the pH seems to have dropped back a little bit. This a significant increase here in 2017 and 18 did raise a lot of questions for me. I was uh, kind of thought that that was an exceptionally high jump and wondering why uh, this happened. Um, if we were to follow the trend between the first, second and last soil sampling campaign, they seem to be more consistent, improving the whole time, but there seems to be an exceptionally high improvement here in 2017 and the 18 in the third campaign. Uh, and after looking into it, I, I noticed that the same jump took place nationally. Um, so, so we are in line with national trends for soil pH across the three catchments. But also, I think it is worth noting that um, when taking a soil sample, we would not recommend taking one within two years of spreading lime. That there is still lime, uh, it takes two years for the lime to be, become fully incorporated into the soil and adjust the soil pH. Um, because we are going out and taking a sample every four years, some of those fields that we have sampled Will, would have had lime applied in the previous year, in the same year, previous year, and the year before that. And, and that wouldn't be advised from a nutrient point of view. So there may be a certain level of inaccuracy and exceptionally high pH is shown in the third campaign because there was a high amount of lime sales in the years running up to that. Um, the phosphorus trend across the three catchments is, de is declining and, and declining gradually. 
Uh, I have broken the, the p values into the indexes. Index one is very low. Um, index two, low. Index three is the optimum agronomic and environmental um, combined target that we would like to see. And index four would be four would be high, considered high. Um, we sit under the regulations, usually the no phosphorus is recommended under index fours um, for, for environmental reasons and also because it's deemed that there isn't a response to P fertilizer or, or fertilizer at index four levels. So I suppose you could say, unfortunately, across the catchments, the P levels are in a slight decline. Potash, on the other hand, is increasing. I often say that K is the forgotten element and I attend a lot of meetings with people on environmental and water quality issues and potash does not cause a problem to water quality directly itself. However, potash is a key element in nutrient management and nitrogen use efficiency will be significantly impacted if the levels of K are inadequate. And if nitrogen use efficiency isn't what you would like it to be, it's going to be lost somewhere along the line and those losses potentially could end up in, in the environment, in the atmosphere or in water quality. So true good nutrient management, soil pHs and soil potash levels um, should be at their optimum. And they are moving in the right direction across all catchments. If we break it down into individual catchments and we look at Ballycanew, it's a heavy soil catchment in County Wexford. It's predominantly grassland high clay content. It's an, an Irish sea mud that was pushed up by the glaciers and left behind um, 10,000 years ago and prior to that in previous glaciations. We can see here um, that the pH is increasing and again it, it did increase significantly in the third campaign and has dropped back a little bit but the overall trend in the pH is moving in the right direction. However it is uh, lower than we would like to see, and there is significant room for improvement in the pH in Ballycanew. In contrast, in the tillage catchment, which is only 20 minutes, 20 minutes to half an hour's drive away, the pH is significantly better. Um, and it's ironic in that this soil here is naturally more acidic, but there is a history of sugar beet in the area, and the farmers there appreciate. Uh, the value of lime and soil pH and, and are very, very much aware of the benefits of that. So the pH was good at starting point and has improved. So you can see the category, the section that are in the pH of between six and a half and seven has grown. Um, and being a tillage soil, we would say that the optimum pH is, is 6.5. Uh, this graph is a slightly different way of showing the trends in tillage fields across the three catchments. Um, and, and what I'm showing here, at the first campaign, the blue line rep represents, at this point, this is all the soils that are the pH below 5.9. And if we looked at what happened to those very same soils in the second campaign, those P, the pH increased. And again, up to around 6.4 in the third campaign and has leveled off there. And the soil, soils with the exceptionally high pH have dropped gradually, but there seems to be a convergence of the tillage soils to a pH of close to 6.5. And again, that, that, that is desirable and that's what we would be looking for. And I think there is a legacy of high pH soils in the Castle Dockwood catchment from factory lime, which was spread out as a byproduct from the sugar industry. And, and those are gradually falling. For dairy farms across all three catchments, again, there is a convergence of the pH. The lower ones have improved significantly and the higher pHs have dropped a little bit, but the convergence is closer to 6.1 or 6.2. Not, not as high as we're seeing in the tillage scenario. And in dry stock uh, across the three catchments, it's very similar to what, what's happened in the dairy. 
I think it's important to just know that at this time, the previous slides I was talking about the actual pH of the soil. When we take a soil sample, it is also analyzed for a thing called the buffering capacity or the buffering pH. And the lime requirement is calculated from the buffering test. And I have compared here the lime requirement in the three catchments, Ballycanoe, a clay soil, Castle Dockwell, a free draining shale, a bedrock soil, predominantly tillage and timber league and intensive dairying, free draining soil over sandstone. So we're comparing the three soils at different pHs. So if we look at the Ballycanoe soil at a pH of 5.8, to, to change that pH to optimum, we need just over three tons of lime per hectare. In Timor League, at the very same pH at 5.8, we need more lime. We need close to five tons to bring the pH to optimum. And in Castle Dockwell, we need even more again. So it's important to distinguish the difference between soil pH and lime requirement. And different soils need a different amount of lime to bring them to the optimum. Some soils will resist a change in pH more so, and that's why we do a buffering test to calculate the lime requirement. That sometimes can, can, be, can be a little bit misleading or confusing. Uh, why is the pH so, so important? Um, I'm coming to phosphorus now uh, and tying this soil pH in with phosphorus. And this is some work that was done by a pH student in the catchments program, Roman Herbert. Um, and he did a more detailed analysis looking at the total phosphorus. Uh, the example here I'm showing is in Ballycanoe. And he compared it with the Morgan's phosphorus. And he also did a malic P. That's some of the results here. Will, will tie in very much with the new soil sampling program that the Department of Agriculture have launched recently. Um, in these two soil samples, one of them was acidic and it had a pH of 5.6, and the other one a very similar soil type, but it had a pH of 6.3, the optimum pH. There was analysis done for the total amount of phosphorus in, in that soil. Most of this is bound and not available to plants. And in the acidic soil, there is considerably more phosphorus at 1350 versus 878 in, in the one that has the correct pH. However, when we look at the Morgan's P, which is considered to be what's plant available, the amount of phosphorus in the Morgan's P is higher even though the total P is considerably less. So the acidic soil, what is happening here, if it goes below pH of 5.8, aluminium in that soil is binding that phosphorus tightly and is making it less available. And it's been locked up by the soil, resulting in a low Morgan's soil test. So it's important to have the pH correct to make best availability of the nutrients that are in that soil. Uh, the P index in Ballycanoe, I mentioned that the soils are more acidic there than we would like. And I think that has an influence here on this graph. You can see that the P index at the start in Ballycanoe wasn't very good. There was a significant number um, heading for 20% in index ones. Um, sorry, heading for 40% and, and a similar amount again in index two. So almost 80% of the soils were suboptimum for P alone, not to mention uh, pH and potash. And unfortunately, in the campaign since, that problem has uh, steadily got worse up until the third campaign, and it now seems to have leveled off. And there seems to be a very slight improvement in index trees between the third and the fourth campaign. Okay. I think it's worth noting here that, that Ballycanoe soils are fantastically good at growing grass. And um, the farmers there will probably say that the yield in, in grass yield isn't by hit, being hit with these low uh, levels of phosphorus. However, um, 
if the trends continue with that like that, it will eventually come, come to have an impact on the yield and it'll bite them. In Timber League, um, we have a contrasting scenario in, in, in that the P levels were starting off were quite good. We had a, over 50% index threes and index fours, and they were pretty steady. Um, they did decrease coming up to the third campaign, but there has been an increase. The worrying here from an environmental point of view is there has been a slight, very slight increase in index fours um, coming up to the in the last campaign from the, from the third to the last side campaign. So in the last four years, there has been a slight increase in index fours. And from a water and environmental point of view, I think we would rather see that increase being in the index threes. The trends in phosphorus, this graph is similar. If we look at the P index one and twos in the first campaign and see what happened to fertility of those fields across 12 years, really for dry stock farmers, they haven't changed. The biggest change is the fields that had high levels of phosphorus have reduced significantly. That's a good news story from the environment. Unfortunately, we haven't seen an increase in the index trees, which is the category that we would like to see. On dairy farms um, across the catchments and Timber League has a high proportion of these farmers in it. So I suppose this is, is reflected in the previous slide. We can see that the, the index fours did drop up to the third campaign, but they have, do seem to have turned a corner and, and increased slightly again. And um, those soils dropped from an index four down to an index three in the third campaign, but the average result of them has moved up into index four again in the last campaign. And in tillage for phosphorus, um, index threes and index ones and twos have, have largely remained relatively unchanged. And the index fours, there was a legacy, as I mentioned, of factory line, and I think they are dropping gradually um, and, and seem to be leveling off kind of at a high index three. The index system for tillage fields is slightly different. The balance are slightly different, so they are now all in index three. Uh, potash, I mentioned, tends to be the forgotten uh, nutrient. And uh, in Ballycanoe, we can see here that the trends for potash are increasing. The index fours are getting better in the last campaign. The index threes are improving. And uh, the index twos have remained pretty much unchanged and the low index ones, while they had increased a bit, it seems to have turned a corner and they're now improving again. In Castle Dockrell, in the tillage catchment, I think this is a, a good news story. It, it, it has taken maybe a little bit of time to get it started, but in the last um, eight to, four to eight years, the levels of potash have increased significantly. And I think we're getting better nitrogen use efficiency as a result of that, um, and, and it's through good nutrient management and interest in the results and good advisory that, that this has taken place. And in Timber League, I, there is also an improvement in the K, but it is not as significant as it's there um, for the Tilly Travers in Castle Dockwood. So we can see that the trend here for the soils that were in K index one and two is that they are moving up. K index three are gradually moving up, but not moving, not moving significantly. And the index four Ks have, have dropped slightly over the 12 years of, of the campaign. And in dry stock, that's quite similar. Dairy farmers, there seems to be a gradual improvement in K levels. And in tillage, equally, the K levels are all moving in the right direction. Tillage farmers, through my own experience working as advisors with them, with the first campaign, they were keen to take the soil results and look at, 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 at take the information and the advice on fertilizer management, more so than on grassland-based uh, dry stock and dairy farmers. Uh, 
when we came out with the trends in soil fertility and talked to the farms about how their individual field and farm fertility levels changed from one campaign to the next, the level of interest in nutrient management has increased. Uh, I mentioned Roman Hebert uh, did some work in the catchments, has done his PhD on, on soil fertility. And I think a lot of the reason why the nutrient soil fertility levels in tillage are moving in the right direction quicker and more so than on grass-based is that um, there is less use of organic fertilizers and more use of chemical, uh, higher proportion of chemical fertilizers being applied to tillage fields. Um, so with that in mind, um, Roman did work comparing cattle slurry versus chemical fertilizer in, in four of the six catchments that we were working in. And we can see here that the yield in grass and dry matter uh, was, at, it was, was in general much the same, if anything, slightly better than chemical fertilizer at the same application rate. Particularly in Ballycanoe and Dunlear, there was a significantly better response from cattle slurry. In Craig Duff, it was the same, and Tim, Tim League, it was more or less the same. There was no significant difference. He also measured the nutrient loss from phosphorus uh, to, the, to water in those, and the cattle slurry was actually safer, and the soil binded and held on to phosphorus from cattle slurry uh, uh, more so than it did from chemical fertilizer. Overall soil fertility across all the catchments, and we look at pH, B, and K, um, it, it, it has improved very slightly since the first campaign. These, these are the results from the last campaign, and we can see that overall 85% of the soil samples and 85% of the area that we're looking at um, does not reach the optimum agronomic levels. And if we include an environmental um, evaluation into that, there is a further 7% that have P index of four that we would like to see coming back into the index three. That's overall. Averages can hide, um, hide a message. And if we look at the story in the Valley Canoe catchment, it is significantly worse. 95% um, of the soils are not optimum. 2% in P index 4. In Castle Dockrell, and the, mar the, the, the majority of the soils here are tillage, and we're talking about a pH of 6.5 versus 6.3, so we have a higher target, and yet 77% of the soils are optimum. 8% are in P index 4, and that is declining over time. In Timaleague, 81% are at our are, are, are suboptimum soil fertility levels. And the concern I have here is, is, is the proportion that are in, in P index four. Okay. So what does this mean and where are we going um, for, for the farms in there? And in advance of today, I, I was looking at a slide that Mark Plunkett presented to advisors in Chagask about a month ago or maybe six weeks ago at this stage. And he came up, he was showing the fertilizer prices in, uh, in last year versus 2021 uh, in, in August, how they have changed since the start of the year. And they've gone up, they, they had gone up by 200 euro a ton. And yesterday I rang the merchants in Tullo, in County Carlow, and they have actually gone up by another 200 euro since then. And they were actually reluctant to, to quote to me because um, fertilizer isn't moving at the moment. It has gone so expensive. Um, and if we see a still a significant proportion of fields at suboptimum fertility levels and fertilizer prices getting higher and higher, um, you would be concerned that uh, soil fertility levels and production are going to be significantly hit if this high price regime continues. It, 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 um, in addition to that, we have policy implications uh, in advance of, of this rise in fertilizer. These were all here. Farm to fork from the European Commission is looking for a 20% reduction in fertilizer use. And if those fertilizer prices maintain, I don't think there would be any problem in achieving that a 50% reduction in nutrient loss. 
Also, the EPA have been publishing this year uh, a significant amount of details on nitrate load entering the estuaries in the east and southeast of the country and, and outlining the trends moving upwards, which is away from the targets for the Water Framework Directive. Uh, greenhouse gas commitments that are going to be outlined next week um, and are being discussed largely. The, the, the three um, gas, well, the, for greenhouse gas, we, we have methane emissions and there's not much we can do to, to reduce those without reducing livestock numbers, but nitrous oxide emissions through improved management and for nutrient use efficiencies can be uh, improved and our main focus for, for agriculture to improve technology to get more per kilogram of nitrogen applied. So we'll, we'll be looking for improvements there and ammonia in a similar way. So there is a lot of focus on nutrient management. Okay, Mark, that's uh, that presentation. Okay, great, Eddie, thanks so much for that. Um, Remind everybody to use the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. And uh, I think you, you really told the story there, uh, Eddie, very well of, of uh, the, the trends that are happening across the catchments in Ireland. And, and I, I fully acknowledge the, the graphs are a really important part of, of telling that story. Um, I, 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 do, I am sorry, Mark. I, 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 not at all. No, no, no. I think you, know, you, you did it. I think you, you did it very, very well, actually. Um, uh, the... the um, I imagine there are people looking at today's presentation and wondering, you know, are we um, looking at uh, the fertility in, ag in, in our soils uh, from, a, uh, from a narrow viewpoint? Uh, because I see some comments coming in through from farmers there who are maybe don't have the, the objective of, of maximizing uh, agricultural production from their land, where in fact, they're, they're, they're maybe their objective is to uh, to to pull back on their stock numbers and uh, to to work uh, on the whole uh, building uh, biodiversity and, and 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 approaching it from that perspective. Um, would you care to comment on that in terms of maybe even just looking at the the phosphorus indices? There, you know, uh, maybe is is a P index three. Is is that um, is that uh, important for everybody, or are there farmers there that perhaps don't need to to be uh, hitting those sorts of indices? It's it may, just just if you if you know where I'm coming from on that. Yeah, no, no, I, I I do, Mark, and I, I agree completely with with the the, the sentiment or or, or or the question. I think it's a very good question. I, I was really a comment on the index system by and large. The index system is. A simplified tool to help us make decisions for, and it was developed for agronomic production. Index one is very low, and it says that, and the definition of index one is that agronomic response to fertilizer is definite. Index two is considered low, and the definition is that response to fertilizer is likely. Three is medium, and where we say that all soils should be. And it's deemed that the agronomic response is tenuous. It might happen and it might not. And index four says that the response doesn't exist, that there, that there isn't one. Across the different soil types, for all nutrients, for phosphorus and for, well, for phosphorus and potash and other nutrients um, in the different catchments, we've discovered that, that the index system and those definitions don't always fit. For example, with the tillage farmers in Castle Dockwell, those soils are naturally high in potash. And many of them are in a high index four. And the farmers there still get a response to potash fertilizer and are, are putting it out on top dressing with 20 not 15 on spring barley. Um, and, and it's given a response. So, so the definition for K for index four is that there wouldn't, wouldn't be a response to it, and yet they are finding a response. Equally, in Ballycanew, the, the P levels are very low and farmers are measuring and growing a lot of grass in Ballycanew at low P index levels. But th they are all production uh, targets that I'm talking about. And um, really, I, I think um, if you're not, um, 
it, it's understandable that people would think that Chagas's message is that all soils should move to index three, and my presentation probably contributed to that. But really, what we need to do is have fertility levels that want to uh, reach the objectives that the farmer has. If, if that farmer is an intensive tillage farmer and he wants to maximize his production, it's very important that he has his pH right and puts on an adequate amount of nutrients. If it's an extensive farmer, for, for example, someone maybe on, in the Barren Life program and they're receiving payments for biodiversity and uh, species rich grassland, putting on excess amounts, or well, putting on optimum amounts of nutrients for perennial ryegrass production don't make sense. Um, yeah. So, 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 so that's where I, I think um, looking at the trend in fertility is important because you could be in an extensive system with biodiversity and species rich um, um, pastures as an objective. And if your fertilities are increasing through maybe mismanagement of organic fertilizers, you need to be aware of that and take action to reduce it. Um, no, no, no different to looking at a trend for a, a production-minded, mm -hmm. uh, intensive farming system. There's, there's, a, there's a, a kind of a follow-on question, which I think will allow a bit of nuance in terms of the, the, what you're talking about. And the question is, I, I only apply 60 units of nitrogen. Do I need index 3 for, for P and K? And I think, I suppose, what the person is getting at is what are the priority uh, elements that I, I operate or I, that I aim for first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I suppose it's difficult to say, Pat, when that person is saying they're applying 60 units of nitrogen. I, I, like, I, I, what, what are their objectives? Is it, well, first of all, is it a grass? I'm assuming it's a grass production system. Um, uh, um, Different soils will behave will behave differently for different nutrients. Um, I, I, as I showed there, the soils in Valley Canoe will, will grow grass at a lower P level to what's there in, in other soils. So the, but the pH and the availability of those nutrients is the cornerstone to that. So for someone applying lower amounts of nitrogen, if they're production minded, P, um, the pH is key and first and foremost before they should start considering about alterating their P and K levels. And I, and, I, and I think I would look at the trend in the parts per million of the P and K. I didn't do that in the graphs there. Mostly I, I was looking at the index system, but on an individual farm and a field basis, I, I would be looking at the actual result in milligrams per liter or parts, parts per million. Does the, the, the slide you showed there with uh, the fertilizer prices, it, it's, it's, it's actually staggering to look at the, the change that has happened within the space of, of less than 12 months. Uh, what, what do you expect the response to be uh, to those prices at, at a farm level? Um, and, and, you know, are, are, are farmers going to reduce their, their nitrogen and, uh, or, or maybe reduce their, their their, their, their phosphorus applications uh, for and, and take a holiday from, from that side of things or you know, what what do you think are, is the response going to be uh, and are there measures that farmers could uh, put in place because we have spoken a lot of, of about um, other ways of, of bringing nitrogen onto the farm outside of using chemical uh, fertilizer yeah yeah um the, the, you're, there's going to be a little, a little bit of, of a broken record in my responses, Mark, but the, one price that I haven't put up there is the price of spreading lime. Okay, and first and foremost, um, there are a lot of nutrients available in the soil already. I showed the amount of total phosphorus that was in the soil. Um, I didn't explain about nitrogen. Like in, in, a, in a hectare of nitrogen tied up in organic matter, on a grassland field, you could have between eight and 16 tons of nitrogen. On the tillage field, you could be talking maybe between four and eight tons of nitrogen. If the pH is the optimum at 6.3 for grassland or 6.5 for tillage, the maximum amount of that organic matter that can be mineralized will be. So, so it will release nitrogen itself. 
and, and the samples there and the trends that I've shown in the catchments, which are no different to what's happening nationally, uh, show that there is still a lot of scope for lime to be spread. So I think when fertilizer prices are going up, one of the first things that should happen is that pHs need to be moved uh, to where they need to be. The second and, and, and equally as important option that is available there and, and we have observed in the catchments is the use of organic fertilizers as opposed to chemical fertilizer. And I mentioned that the tillage, the trends in fertility in the Castle Dockwell and on the tillage farms and the other catchments is by and large better and moving in the correct direction. And the reason for that is the majority of the nutrients being applied are being purchased through chemical fertilizer. On livestock farms, we have organic fertilizer applications, mostly cattle slurry, but also imported. Um, there's pig slurry, um, digestate from anaerobic digesters of poultry manure being applied. And the decisions based around organic fertilizer uh, application rates do have significant room for improvement. Um, the, the decisions that go into a farmer's mind which, which impact on when and where they spread the fer organic fertilizer are not always purely determined by the nutrient uh, requirement of the crop and the soil fertility. Um, if you have slurry storage up to a certain amount and your tanks are full, you need to spread it. Um, it takes time to travel with spreading it. You're going to spread it on your driest land and you're going to spread it on fields probably closer to where it's been stored. And we can see that in, in uh, our results in, in the catchments. So there is a lot of scope for improvement in nutrient management with organic fertilizers. And they work. Um, also, I, I didn't show a slide on this, but with on Roman's PhD, he compared poultry manure pig slurry and cattle slurry with chemical fertilizer. And from a plant availability point of view, pig slurry and poultry manure will um, release, for the same amount of phosphorus fertilizer applied, they will make more, uh, a more significant change in plant available P. Uh, won't be any riskier from a water soluble runoff uh, solution with the exception of pig slurry close to spreading time. Um, and cattle slurry, as I shown there uh, on the slide that I did show on the trials that he did, that he uses, is, is statistically the same, but, but probably marginally better than chemical phosphorus. Um, We've about, um, just uh, about 10 minutes left, Eddie, and lots of questions coming through. So I'm going to hand straight over to Pat and uh, maybe if we could try and uh, give rapid, a rapid fire round and try and get through as many of the questions as possible. So uh, and one, 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 Eddie, I know you've answered before. Was there much of a correlation between soil fertility and nutrient levels in water? No. Uh, yes and no. Um, across the six catchments, the, the, the classic example to say that, that there isn't is the Ballycanoe catchment. It is a heavy soil type. And, and uh, at the start, I showed the slide with the nutrient transfer continuum. Um, phosphorus is usually, usually of concern with a runoff uh, type soil. So if you have a high clay content, they get, get wet quickly. And the type of rain that we had here in Wexford uh, yesterday was so heavy that the soils would have got saturated and water would have run off the surface. So the soils there, ironically also have the lowest lowest P levels of all six catchments, but it has the second highest uh, P loss to water of the six catchments. And so, so there are different factors that impact on, on, on nutrient. And, and this was a key message from the catchments program is you need to put, you need to put the right measure in the right place and uh, limiting phosphorus application in Valley Canoe is is not going to um, is not going to improve or or reduce the risk of pea run, uh, runoff. It's the timing of application and the location of application that will make a difference there. It's about breaking the pathway, which is a runoff scenario. In contrast with, um, I suppose maybe with with uh, 
the Timalee catchment in Cork, the, the pathway for phosphorus has been lost. We have found that phosphorus moves through groundwater there um, and high soil fertility levels on that soil type would be risky. And, 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 and they have potential for increasing, increasing it. So, so sometimes yes, and sometimes no. And we, and we need to understand question that in relation the, to the process. Right. A question there in relation, in relation to the uh, kind of uh, levels of, of index three and, and the fact that they're generally not increasing. Is there a problem with uh, the distribution of nutrient around the farm that we're not seeing uh, uh, an increase in level three and decreases in, or in index three and, and, and decreases in index four? Or... Yeah, but I suppose I, I, I'm coming back to my comment on, on applications of organic fertilizer. Um, and uh, Noli McDonald did research comparing um, two tillage catchments in the catchments, one which had a higher proportion of organic fertilizer being applied. And I'd say there is, there is a problem there. With, with management of nutrients coming from organic uh, sources. For, for example, the, people could be applying organic fertilizer as a source of nitrogen for growing crops, but they do organic, um, they're not as straight. <laughs> it's not like spreading urea to potash, or, or, so that they're supplying organic matter, they're supplying nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, potash, sulfur, and they're, they're supplying many, many benefits to the soil. But if it's been put on, from a mindset of nitrogen alone, there could be an imbalance of other nutrients going out. Just a comment here you might comment on, is Chagas trying to maximize farm production or farm profit? And just saying they're not the same thing. Yeah, and, and, um, yeah I, I, I think that's a very good comment. Um, and I think a, a, a significant, um, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> Mark Plunkett is going to have a lot of work with, uh, calculating tables on, on, on uh, economic response from fertilizers to look at farm profit and the optimum amount being applied with, with those changes in prices there. But again, um, I think for grassland-based systems, grass measuring will tell people how much their yield of grass is per uh, field. And um, the, the, uh, my, my opinion, why tillage farmers bought into the soil results and nutrient advice much quicker than on grassland based systems is that in general, if you're not budgeting grass, you don't know what your yield from an individual field is if you're selling milk or selling beef or selling lamb. If you're a tillage farmer and you're selling spring barley or oilseed rape, you know what came off each field and you know the impact of of, of, um, of um, inappropriate nutrient management. Now, if you are budgeting grass and you know that your P index two fields are growing 16 ton and you're utilizing 14 ton of grass of a P index two, that should be your target and stick with that. And no one knows that better than the farmer that's working on that has grown up and is working on those soil types themselves. The index system is a good system for general advice and putting it there but they need to be nuanced and tailored to individual soil types across the country. And, and it's farmers that are working on those that know their own farm best and advisors working in a locality that know that um, 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 to, to make those decisions. Okay. There's a question there in relation to, uh, and I suppose it's, it maybe harken back to your own experience as an advisor in the catchment, uh, asking what has worked with farmers to get improvements uh, in soil fertility management amongst the farmers in the in the catchments, um, a, a, a continuous declining trend, or a continuous increasing trend, rather than a snapshot of the soil fertility at a single time, works well. And and. One thing that I haven't shown there is that the fertility levels, I showed the trends in fertility levels between enterprise and between catchment. If you look at an individual catchment and look at the soil fertility between one farm and another, you will see marked differences. And Simon, I mentioned, produce, uses GIS. 
and he can produce color coded maps for soil fertility. And if we look at a catchment and we color code it for pH or we color code it for phosphorus or potash, you can identify farm boundaries from those color codes. So nutrient management is a farm specific thing and it has influenced the fertility on an overall farm basis to an extent that we can, we can identify one farm from another based on the soil fertility levels. Sorry, Pat, I'm after getting a little yeah, bit. No, 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 that's fine. No, no, that's, that's quite clear. There's, there's a question there, uh, um, a, a double, uh, or two questions I'll put the two of them together. What are the risk factors uh, for losing uh, nutrients for, for, from land? And uh, what are the kind of uh, specific advices that need to be given to farmers in different circumstances to try and prevent that loss? I, it, <laughs> that's a long answer. I, it depends on the nutrient and it depends on the soil type and it depends on the weather. Okay, from a phosphorus point of view, um, by and large, it's a runoff scenario and the timing that you apply the phosphorus um, is key. So, uh, so rather than the total amount, if you can put out phosphorus at a time when runoff is not likely to happen, in other words, application of phosphorus when soils are not saturated and heavy rainfall is not forecast, then it's less likely to cause a problem. And remember, the amount of phosphorus needed to, to exceed limits is very small agronomically. We're talking about less than one unit per acre per year that, that would cause a problem. So, so rather than talking about overall phosphorus application rate, I think it's to do with soil conditions when it's been spread and buffer strips and avoiding what we term as critical source areas, which contribute to an excessive amount of runoff. Nitrogen is a, is a completely different pathway that it gets into, into the soil. And really, from a nitrogen point of view, we're talking about excellent nitrogen use efficiency. In other words, that the nitrogen that you put out is, is removed in crop offtakes and avoiding excess application rates and avoiding uh, uh, nitrogen being there at a time when growth is minimal or non-existent. Eddie, there's quite a, a, a few questions coming in around the the the, uh, the types of, of assessments of soil health that we're doing, um, and uh, we had Fiona Brennan uh, on the signpost uh, series a number of months ago talking about the biodiversity aspect of soil quality. Um, is that something that is being examined within the catchments program, or is, are there plans to to take that that aspect or understand that aspect of soil health? Um, we, we do collaborate with a lot of researchers and, and we'd be working closely with Fiona uh, and some of her, um, sometimes she, she would carry out some of her work on sites located within the catchments and, and the other um, mostly um, PhD students, but by and large it's not a major focus um, of, of our work in the catchments. Okay. But so soil fertility and the levels that have gone through here are only one aspect of, of soil health. Uh, soil structure and soil texture. Um, texture is obviously we can't change. The sand, silt and clay is there, but the soil structure and, com and compaction and the, soil and the soil pH equally, I think, is key, um, key to, 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 to both soil health and soil nutrient availability. There. Okay. Um, and I mentioned we are measuring carbon now as well, which, which we'll carry on with that. Okay, um, we, we're going to have to wrap it up there. Uh, we're just right out of time. Um, Eddie, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to get through all of the questions today. There's a lot of interest in this topic. So, uh, Eddie, we might get you back again on, uh, to talk about maybe those other aspects that we were, we were talking about there as well. But I think okay. it's, it is important to say that and, and you've said it there that the, we're only looking at one aspect of, of soil health here today um, and that there, there, there is a, a more holistic uh, view uh, that, that, that we're taking and, and obviously more research is, is required in that particular area. 
Okay. Um, Pat, thanks for helping with questions. Eddie, thanks again for your presentation. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to let you know that we're, we'll be joined next week by Dr. Catherine Keena, who's going to be talking about assessing biodiversity management practices on intensively managed farmland. So do join us uh, next week for uh, 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 Catherine's presentation. Um, and a reminder again that uh, today's session is recorded and will be available on the Chagas website along with the presentation. Um, and you can tune in also to the Chagas uh, Signpost uh, podcast series, uh, which will give you an audio version of, of what's been presented here today and all previous uh, webinars as well. So with that, we'll leave you and we will talk to you next week at 9.30. Have a good weekend and uh, enjoy the Halloween break. Okay, thanks everybody. Mark, I'm Pat.